Welcome to season 12 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week I have a fellow tennis parent, an incredible volunteer, an incredible supporter of the game of tennis, Violet Clark. Violet is the mom of three tennis playing daughters, the youngest of whom, Gabby, went to Emory University, where she won the NCAA singles championship as a sophomore and again as a senior. So um, winning two times that NCAA championship is just unbelievable. But I am so excited for you guys to hear from Violet. She shares her family's journey in tennis, her own journey as a volunteer in all different kinds of ways, but um, most notably as a volunteer with USDA, which of course is the governing body of American tennis. So without further ado, I bring you Vi Clark. Vi Clark, it is such a pleasure to meet you and to have you on the podcast. I could not be more excited to talk to a fellow tennis parent, somebody who's been in the trenches, and like me, somebody whose kids are through the process, but you're still out in the trenches. I love it. Well, thank you, Lisa. I appreciate the invite. Always uh, an opportunity. To, I love the opportunity to be able to speak to parents about my experiences and also um, to maybe talk about some non-traditional approaches to your kids playing tennis through the system. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just jump right in. And I want to know how tennis came to be part of your life and, and not just part of your life, like a commanding presence in your life. <laughs> Yeah, so my, again, I'm primarily a tennis volunteer at this point, which started through my children. Um, quick story, we, our family started playing tennis because we used to vacation in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And on the Outer Banks, it's great when it's the beach, when the sun's out on the beach, but when it's not, uh, then you have to find something indoors. And we always had like 10 kids. There were 10 kids, six families or whatever. And so when it would rain, we'd go to the local tennis club and the tennis pro would have an activity for the kids like all morning. So it was great. And that's how we got introduced. And my oldest daughter came back at, she was probably about 10 or 11 at that point. And when she came home, she decided she wanted to play. And so we looked at a number of programs, went to a number of clubs, and that really wasn't her cup of tea until we found a program called Love to Serve, which is a grassroots program, um, African-American centric in the, on the south side of Chicago. And she found her community with Love to Serve. And that's where we started. And I started volunteering and she started playing and we traveled with them and played tournaments with them. And that's how we got connected. So again, my approach to the game comes from all of the benefits that the game has to offer our kids and our families. And um, as the kids have grown, um, we, we use tennis metaphors really to, to talk about life. So tennis is really a metaphor for, uh, for raising decent humans. So that's, that's sort of how we got introduced to the game. You and I definitely speak the same language. I love it um, because I talk about that a lot too with the Parenting Aces community that, you know, these lessons that our kids are learning on the tennis court, yes, they serve them well for the years that they're competing as tennis players. But my goodness, once they get out into the real world, they start to really realize how valuable those lessons are and how useful they are in interpersonal relations and in professional relations, everything. Right. And if you, I mean, if you look at, especially when you start talking about team, um, uh, tennis and teams, when you look at all of the literature about who are the most successful in business and who are most successful in life, it's people who have been part of teams. And that's another reason why being part of tennis, um, especially if you're going to play collegiately or you're going to play local team competition, is valuable because you do learn all of those skills in business, whether you're the leader of the team or whether you're the sixth person on the bench and your contributions to the team, right? It's, you know, it's still about how do you contribute and how do you bring your value forward? And again, tennis is a perfect way to learn those lessons. Yeah, for sure. I want to talk a little bit more about love to serve and this whole notion of training and competing as a team from the get go, because 
my experience in tennis with my son was very individual, right? It was um, find the coach, you know, he would go to drills, yes, and be in a group, but you know, they weren't traveling as a group to tournaments. They weren't competing as a group. Um, it was very much, you know, dog eat dog out there and, you know, fighting for your spot um, in terms of getting attention from the coach, um, getting that one-on-one -on -one time and things like that. So I'm very intrigued by what Love to Serve is and does and how you found it. Yeah, so we found it just by asking people because my daughter really wanted to play and the tennis club scene was just, she wasn't interested in that. Um, and finally, somebody said, hey, there's this community organization on the South Side, you should go look into it, check it out. So we went and again, they were primarily in the summers at that point and then they did have some indoor classes as the fall um, approach, but it was primarily um, during the, uh, the outdoor season. But what Love to Serve did is it's it first of all the goal was to identify tennis as a means for um, African Americans to go to college, mm -hmm. right, and to play tennis and learn the game. And it was started by Lamont Bryant, who really learned he was more of a gym teacher who learned the game, and then he was teaching the community how to play. Um, and so. Our, our whole introduction to tennis was from the team perspective first. So the kids would be really young. And um, so they would start, like Gabby started with Love to Surf probably at six, um, actually playing tournaments, because I told her she had to learn how, to, my youngest, I told her she had to learn how to keep score before she could play a tournament. That was my one rule. You know, you have to defend yourself on the court. But um, what we would do is we would travel as a group to the, to Indianapolis for a tennis tournament. And all the kids would have three skirts or three pairs of shorts. And you'd have a white one and a red one and a black one. And they'd all have love to serve t-shirts and everybody would go and watch each other play their matches and root each other on. Um, but again, in terms of tennis being a way to learn life skills, they, Lamont would give the kids envelopes with money in it for each meal. So as we stopped at the restaurant, the kids had to use their money, learn how to tip, learn which forks to use at the restaurant, learn how to engage with the, um, the wait staff. And so from the time we would leave uh, the bus stop, because we'd travel on a big bus to where we got to where we're going, the kids were learning how to live life. Like, how do you count your change and all of that from six years old, all the way up to like 18. Um, and so we spent a lot of time, yes, we practices were fun, but it was more in the team concept than an individual concept. Yes, you had individual um, uh, tournaments and matches to play, but you were going as the Love to Serve team. So when you'd show up in uniform, everybody knew you were from Love to Serve and you were expected to behave well and you were expected to be good sports. and all of those things. And so that's how we got introduced to the game, which is like how the kids get introduced to soccer, right? It's a team by team. And it's, to me, there's so much value in that interaction that the, I prefer tennis, but the sport doesn't actually matter, right? It can be, it can be track, it can be soccer, it can be lacrosse, it can be anything else, but you know, how do you build relationships? How do you practice? Do you persevere? Do you work hard? Like, what are you really doing to build your own self-esteem and to be able to do something that you enjoy, but you also learn something from? So, yeah, but that's how we got started. I just love that. And so lest anybody listening to this think that Vi started her kids in this, you know, grassroots program and, you know, they became decent players. Um, let's just kind of jump ahead to Gabby's accomplishments because I just want everybody to know Gabby went on to play college tennis at Emory University, went on to win the individual singles championship, not once, but twice, first year as a sophomore. And this was at the division three level. But Emory University, again, for those who think Division Three is the bottom of the college food chain, you are grab, I'm grandly mistaken. Um, 
Emory University could compete with any collegiate tennis team from any division on any day and come out ahead. So um, let's just be clear about the environment that she was competing in and achieving such success, all as a result of starting in a grassroots team environment that took her through to this incredible college experience. So from the time that she started, and, and your other two daughters as well, started with uh, Love to Serve, what was the progression um, in terms of playing tournaments, developing as tennis players, but then also balancing that with academic development too? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's what was so great about Love to Serve. They definitely had the coaching staff and all of the skills to develop the tennis players, right? Um, if you've got good athletes, you've got kids who work hard, you've got kids to show up at practice and want to do things, then they'll learn how to play the game. Um, and so as uh, my kids all played at different levels, my oldest daughter went to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She played club tennis there. She's the one that will play just for fun now. Um, she didn't play D1, didn't get the scholarship and all that, but never tried to. That's not how she wanted to do it. My middle daughter played club tennis at Cornell for a while. She's still active. She volunteers with USTA. She's still very active in tennis. Loves the game, still very active. Gabby, as she uh, went through the process, of uh, she developed. She wanted to play more and she wanted to play more and more and more. Um, her decision to go to a D3 school, because I think that's really important, is that, yes, you're right. Emory had, at the, especially at that time, they had a lot of the top 30 players nationally thir or top 50 players nationally, right, in their classes. But that was because kids were making a decision at that time whether they wanted to play tennis or whether they wanted to have a college experience as well as get an education. Gabby's decision to go was based on the fact she wanted to get a quality education, she wanted competitive tennis, and she wanted to play high in the, in, in the lineup. She didn't want to ride the bench. Now, she could have gone to D1, gotten a scholarship, probably, I don't know where she would have played, maybe three, maybe four, but she wouldn't have that national, those two national championships that yeah. she had. And she was playing at that time against other top players. And so I think, and to, to me, it's really not much different than the Ivies in terms of the level of education plus, uh, you know, the level of tennis and all of those things. But she just worked hard. She, she's a great athlete. Um, you know, she played two sports at Emory. So she played tennis and she played, she ran track for two years, indoor track. Um, but the development cycle was going through the process of the junior tournament cycle and all of those things. I will say if I had it to do over, she would have played half the tournaments. Mm. I just don't think at the end of the day, the tournaments themselves were the key. It was the competition, finding quality competition and quality coaching in the right environment is just as valuable from the tennis player's perspective um, as some of the national tournaments and things like that. So if for her, I'm not saying that's true for everybody, but for her, I would have probably reduced by at least a third the amount of coaching and the, the, the amount of things we did um, because I, she traveled with her coach to all the national tournaments. She was a top national player when she graduated from high school, all of those things. But um, I'm not sure that you have to do all of that and that you have to follow the crowd in terms of your child's uh, development through the system or through the process. So, yeah. Well, let's dig into that because that, that's very interesting. And, and I'm with you. I, I, my son definitely played more tournaments than was necessary and which probably led to a lot of strife and um, discord in the family. <laughs> but Absolutely. Um, you know, it's very stressful um, for, on everybody. So let's talk about this kind of developmental pathway. And from the place you sit now on the backside of this journey, three times over, if you were designing the perfect high school years, and, and I'm not going to 
start with the 10 and unders because that's a whole different animal. But let's let's start with high school years when the kids are starting to kind of understand that they've got to get in front of college coaches, that ratings and rankings are becoming, you know, the only thing they think and talk about um, for the good or the bad. And, you know, we can get into that if we have time. But what would you have done differently? I, I probably would have focused on the development side of the game more so than the tournament side of the game. Um, and that is, I'm not saying that we wouldn't have spent time working on the game, but I wouldn't have done all the travel. Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't have done it. A um, couple of reasons for it, right? If she had been home more, she would have probably enjoyed herself more. Um, her grades were fine. She was at a very competitive private school here in Chicago, University of Chicago Laboratory Schools, did fine. But I just wonder whether if we were taking one of those tournaments a month and spending just developing either with programs or groups or with her coach or footwork drills, something else to supplement it. I think she would have been as good or maybe even better as a player, right? Because you didn't need the tournament. You needed to, the development. Mm -hmm. And so what I would have done is I would have cut out some of the travel um, and supplemented it with just learning more things. Um, she, she did start doing fitness and working with a trainer and doing some other things, which I thought ended up being more valuable than some of the tournament time, actually, yeah. right? What she learned about her body and everything else. But I also think it's important to know why you're, for the kids to know why they're doing it. She was not doing it for the scholarship. She was doing it because she loved the game. So scholarship wasn't part of our, if, yeah, if that's where she decided to go, fine. But she was doing it because she likes the, she loved the game. She loved to compete and that kind of thing. So I think, like if you want to get that scholarship and that you have to do the tournaments to be on the coach's radar, then you might have to do that. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't our goal. That wasn't our goal. She, you know, we wanted to get into the right tournaments because she was recruited from clay courts by Emery's assistant coach at the time. Um, but she was recruited for her doubles because mm -hmm. they needed the doubles point, right? Even and she ended up playing number one singles and doubles all four years, but that's why she was recruited. So I would just think about it differently. Like what, what do you really want out of the experience? Mm -hmm. She knew she wanted a college experience. So, you know, knowing that now, and that's always what it was, why did I need to do all of that? Yeah. But I didn't know there was any other way. I didn't know there was an option because I went along with the crowd. That's right. Like if everybody well, else was sending that. that. Yeah. We yeah. all, do that because how, how are you supposed to know? And if you, buck the crowd you buck the system all you hear is well why isn't she playing this tournament why aren't you traveling there why isn't you know she's taking a day off she's taking a week off like what are you doing and right. you start to doubt yourself and and as the parent you know god forbid your child doesn't reach their goal and then it's your fault because you didn't let them do whatever it, you know it's well, it's a no win i feel like um well, I, I think there is a win once you realize that that you don't feel guilty, like, you know, your kid, you know, like, like I had to say to myself, like, stop, like, I'm not going to just do this because everybody else is saying do it or go. I'll do as much as I can. But I, at the end of it's, you know, sometimes we, we want so much for them that it's us, like they're per perfectly satisfied. And it's because we want so much for them, but it's, I think paying attention to what the child really wants matters more at the end so at the end I was a little better about you want to go to the concert you know what you won't play this this weekend um and then I think about well if I had done that junior year that probably and you know what I could have done that some freshman year as well and maybe you know that freshman that one exam that she really didn't do that well on freshman year she probably would have done better if I let her stay and go to the party right so you know so in retrospect I I would have you know, lifted my foot off the accelerator a little bit because it was should have been more about what she wanted as, as opposed to what these parents were telling me I should do. Right. Um, and as a parent, we just sometimes need to, you know, take a deep breath, step back and say, why are we really doing it? And does that make sense for our family? Well, and also to trust your gut, right? I yes. mean, as, as you've said numerous times already, 
nobody knows your kid like you do. And you have to trust yourself as the parent to make the decisions that are right for that particular child in that particular moment. And it's not to say that what's right for one of your children is necessarily right for the other of your children. But again, it's that trust. And I think as parents, we don't have enough trust in our gut and we don't pay close enough attention because we are, you know, so bombarded with information from the outside and, you know, that fear of, oh my gosh, if I don't do this, my child's going to fall behind. Well, and it's also that we're saying, well, we'll look like bad parents. <laughs> and, and, you know, that. it's like, yeah, like you, well, you're not going to do what? And then it's like, oh my goodness, I look like I'm a bad parent. Well, no, actually, I'm not going to do that because I'm making the decision that's best for my family, right? Or for my child or whatever. Um, so it, the other part of it is separating yourself from your child and their tennis journey. Yeah. Right. Their that's tennis so journey hard. is going to be different. It's so hard. You know, even like my are all grown, everybody's over 30, right? And I'm still in their business, like, well, can't you do it this way? Yeah. But you know, or somebody said that this was a good opportunity for you. You want to try it? And then I have to say, okay, you all are adults, you know, you've learned how to make really good decisions uh, for yourself. And that's what you're trying to do, even in high school, right? You're trying to teach them how to make good decisions. So when they're doing things, trying to make decisions for themselves, you got to let go of the reins some. Um, and I would have done it more in the tennis context if if I had, if I had the maturity about this subject um, then as I do now. She was probably right. She didn't need to do everything that I was asked, making her do. Yeah. Um, so yeah. let me just ask you because I I'm very cognizant that we are on a tight time frame here, and I, I've got so much I want to talk to you about. Um, what was your role in the college recruiting or just college application and decision process with your girls? And was it different for each one? Um, do you feel like you learned from, you know, daughter number one to daughter number two to daughter number three, or were you starting at ground zero each time? No, so one and two really weren't that interested in playing on team on the team one definitely not mm -hmm. two would have but she went she the school she she went to Cornell she went to the hotel school she was really more into the school than the team and that's why she played club a little bit mm -hmm. um and so that was um you know that's why she did that um so that that was different it was different for Gabby though because of uh because she did want to play on the team Mm -hmm. But I had been in the system enough that I knew sort of how it worked. She's also a self-starter so that and very independent. So she did it herself. Right. Um, when coaches would reach out, she would respond to the ones she was interested in and not interested in. Um, when I would try to push schools on her or go do it, uh, she would go or she would do. But they all turned out to be disasters because she didn't want to do it so I learned pretty quickly just to back off and let her let her handle it mm -hmm. um and so at the end of the at the end Emery was the place she wanted to go and that's what she pushed for and she worked with Amy to to get there and and that's then the rest is history so to speak so how did she learn about Emery I mean she grew up in Chicago. Emory's in Atlanta, just for those of you who don't know. Um, and and it's a smaller school. So it's, you know, it's not a big rah-rah football school that mm -hmm. everybody has heard of. Yeah. So um, University of Chicago Lab School actually had a couple of other people who had uh, who had gone to Emory before. Um, there were also people, there were a couple of uh, girls who played for Emory that uh, she had, Gabby had been in groups with. So she had heard of Emory. But in her, in her high school, they uh, do a really good job of co college prep, like college prep, helping the uh, counselors, helping them to dis determine schools. Mm -hmm. So Emory was not on her list until after clay course. Okay. But once she uh, was approached by Meredith, the coach, to be interested, then we put it on her list. Mm -hmm. So she had sort of heard of it, she knew of it, but then when she saw the academic level, the team level, it was sort of like exactly what she wanted. 
in, in a college experience. So at that point, she was looking at those, you know, the D3 schools, those schools like that, or the Ivies. Um, and it just so happened that all of it worked out for Emory, but she had heard of Emory. She had, her school has great um, college counseling. And so that's how it all came together. That's awesome. Yeah. Was professional tennis ever on her radar? Not really. Um, yeah, no, she never, that was never her goal. You know, again, parents looking at her talent and I'm like, wow, you could really do this. And she was like, no, that's not what I want to do. So it's at, at some point I thought it was for her, but she never thought it was for her. And so, no, um, but she's, you know, she's working in sports now, right? She's working for the LA 2028 Olympics. Um, so that's, you know, so sport is where she ended up, but not as a professional tennis player. I love it. But, so, you know, she brings uh, an intimate knowledge of what it means to be an athlete, what it means to be a competitor. So working in sports as a former competitive athlete herself has to be such a huge advantage and make her that much more marketable, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, there are so few women in sports. Um, so she's working in sports at a level that we need, where we need to show up, right? We need more women in sport, just sports executives and all through sport in general. So again, it tennis served a purpose that we couldn't have foreseen at the time, right? And all the things she learned and the contacts she made and how to engage with people have helped her to uh, have a really successful career in sports. So yeah, I love yeah, that. So. Okay, so your kids are grown I, I, and I'm, I'm watching the clock. I'm like, oh my gosh. That's okay. fine. Oh, we can uh, always do a part two some other, if you, you know, if yes, you want to some for other sure. day. But. For sure. But you are still very active with USTA in the yeah. Chicago area, USTA Midwest. Um, what is your role <laughs> today? What, what area? So, so actually I'm on the national board, USA national board. Uh, and I've been on the national board. This is my third term. So it's my fifth year. Um, and uh, yeah, so I have always been a volunteer starting with love to serve. That's how I get connected to the game. And I've been a volunteer since then. Um, so I did work with the Chicago district. I did, I volunteered love to serve on their board, mid Midwest section. I was a past president there as well. Um, and now I, uh, I am on the board. And uh, actually we have a board meeting in Colorado Springs on Thursday. So I'll be heading out that way Thursday morning. Um, and uh, we are the governing body for the sport um, in the country. And so it gives me an opportunity to set some policy, to, to see what we're doing, to try to lend whatever experience or, uh, you know, that I have that I can um, share with, you know, the country. Um, we do everything from, you know, we're not just the US Open. Um, we do uh, support um, and deliver all of the tennis throughout the United States. So we come in contact, every child that plays tennis or every league player has somehow connected to the USTA. So. Uh, but I just, you know, uh, this game has been really, really important to our family um, at even, all the girls, right? And so therefore I feel the need to just give back, to share what I can share and, um, you know, to see where I can be of help. And so, you know, that's what we do. All right, one last quick question. Sure. If, if our listeners want to get involved as a volunteer with USTA or with a local grassroots tennis organization, what would be your advice to how to get started? Yeah, my advice would be to go on the website of their section um, and basically go or go on the USTA website put in your zip code and your address and it will direct, if you're not already connected with the USTA, it will direct you to your local area and reach out to them to see where, where you can help or where, because you don't have, you don't even have to have a child. Like if you just want to help the community, you can find a local community tennis organization that might need some volunteers or need some board members or things of that nature. Um, and you can just go on and then reach out to your local district or your local um, uh, your local section and to see whether the volunteer opportunities are. Um, that's the best way. Just reach, go to the website or go to the website of your section or your district and 
um, you know, ask where you can, where you fit, where you can fit in. Yeah. And uh, we are welcoming all, everyone who, anybody who wants to come join us um, because we, we love this game. Yeah. Really well, do. and for those of us who, you know, tend to get dragged down by the negatives and focus on the things that aren't going right, what a wonderful way to facilitate change and, you know, be part of that change and, and help open the eyes of people that may be separated from what's happening on the ground and, you know, offering your insight and your experience. So right. um, thank you and, for continuing to volunteer at the Yeah. Level. And also, I mean, you also make a good point. The other place for people to go would be the USTA Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, because the foundation is a, uh, really, that's where our National Junior Tennis League program, and it's not L league anymore, I forget what the new acronym is. Junior but, Tennis um, Education and Learning or something? NJ learning, yeah, NJTL. So yeah. that's where our NJTLs are housed. And for people who don't know, the whole purpose is to tie tennis with education. And so we have programs throughout the country where we're reaching into communities that are under-resourced and providing educational opportunities as well as tennis opportunities for those children, many of whom go on or most of whom go on to be in college, maybe play in college but, and get college scholarships. But if they don't get uh, tennis scholarships, many of them get academic scholarships. So it's a way that uh, tennis is impacting our communities in different ways. And so there are always volunteer opportunities at the NJTL level and at the foundation level. Um, and there are also ways you can give to the foundation to support the efforts to grow the game and also to support young people um, and give them opportunities to really, that will really make a difference in their lives. And so that's why I volunteer. Yes. Well, you you are, you know, the billboard, you should be the spokesperson for every volunteer. And, and just as somebody who benefits from the work that you do, I want to say thank you and please keep giving. <laughs> we, <laughs> oh, I will. I, I think I'm hooked. You know, it's almost now like uh, an addiction. I can't let it go. So I, I know the feeling. <laughs> I did I definitely know the feeling. Well, Violet, thank you so much for taking time out of your crazy busy life to chat with us at Parenting Aces. I definitely want to do a part two and um, you know, dig a little deeper into your daughters and and their life in tennis and and your role in all of that. But um, it's just such a pleasure to meet you. And yeah, I'm and very I'd love to a part Amy too. Bryant for connecting us. So. Yeah, thanks, Amy. One of my favorite people. And also on the part two, I will also would have some more information. I'd like to share more about what's going on with USTA and how we're really trying to work with communities mm -hmm. to you know to really change sort of the narrative around what tennis is and what the USTA is and all of those. We're really doing some new creative things that I think people would be interested in. So sure. um, I think it would be worth that to talk about. I always look, talk about my kids. So that's, that's easy. So. Well, <laughs> and thank I, you for I the opportunity. I have you back. And uh, in the very near future, we'll, we'll connect offline and, and find another day to, to record. But in the meantime, thank you so much for your time. Thank and you. It was really fun. And I really appreciate it. Absolutely. To my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.